Welcome to our review on plant diseases and defences. When we're thinking about the diseases that plants can get, we're actually thinking about several different types. And the first one of these are caused by something that's not contagious, so it's not going to spread from plant to plant. It's all down to a lack of mineral ions within the soil in which the plants are growing in. So as a result of that, our plants can't get the minerals they need and therefore they show deficiency symptoms. For AQA, there are two minerals you need to know about. The first one is nitrates and the nitrates are needed to make protein so the plant can grow. So a lack of nitrates means that they've got stunted growth and you can see that in the picture in the bottom left. The second one is magnesium, which is needed to make chlorophyll in our plants. So if there's a lack of magnesium in the soil, then our plant suffers with something called chlorosis, which is just where the leaves look yellow, as you can see on the left of the picture there, which is all down to the fact that there's a lack of chlorophyll present. And chlorophyll is obviously the green pigment in our plants. The second type of disease are those that are caused by pathogens. And in our earlier videos, we've looked at these in more detail. But just to remind you of the two you need to know, we've got tobacco mosaic virus, which is caused by a virus. And then we've got rose black spot, which is caused by a fungus. The final type of problem our plants can have is as a result of insect damage. And the insect you need to know about on AQA is the good old aphid. So I've given you a lovely zoomed in close up in the bottom left there and what it looks like when you just look at the plant from a distance. And as you can see, these little aphids can absolutely cover plants. And as a result of their presence, they can do an awful lot of damage to them. If you are anyone that grows plants at all, whether it be in your garden, in your house, or as an actual farmer, then one of the key things that we need to consider is how we can detect diseases as quickly as possible. Because the quicker we can actually detect the disease, then the more likely it is that we can effectively treat it. So when we're thinking about how we can detect these diseases, there's certain things we can look for. So we can look for some of those symptoms of disease, the stunted growth, spots on leaves, if there's any areas that are already starting to rot or decay, for example. We might be looking for abnormal growth, so anything like a gall sticking off the side of the plant. The stems or the leaves may appear sort of misformed or malformed, so they might be a little bit weird looking. We can also have different discolorations, or it may be as easy as just saying, oh look, there's a whole horde of aphids on my plant, I've got a problem. So the presence of pests is another clear indicator. Once we've actually identified the fact that we've got a problem, then we need to identify the cause of the actual problem. And this isn't so easy in plants because an awful lot of plant diseases have pretty similar symptoms to one another. So it's not a case of if the leaves go yellow, then it must be disease X, because it could be a whole range of diseases causing that same symptom. But the key thing is still getting that early identification so that we can either get the right treatment in place so that they've got a greater chance of recovery, or if it's a disease that we can't treat, get rid of the plant as soon as possible so that we can restrict the amount it can spread to others in the area. We've got three key ways that we can identify our disease in our plant then. The first is as simple as getting a gardening book or a gardening website open and then just having a look at the symptoms on your plant and trying to match it with what's in the book or on the web page. Secondly, we can actually examine the plant in a lab to try to identify what's causing the problem. Or we can also use a test kit on site that will identify our pathogen through the use of the monoclonal antibodies. One thing that we do need to bear in mind, though, is that plants aren't these poor things that require human intervention to keep them alive. You know, they're not as ridiculous as a giant panda, for example. What we actually have here are organisms that have a whole range of their own defences against disease. And these defences fall into one of three key categories. They're either physical, chemical or mechanical defences. 
If we think about the physical defences first of all, then these quite simply are physical barriers that are just reducing the ability of the pathogen to invade the plant in the first instance. So three key ones that you need to know about for your exam. First one are the cellulose cell walls that surround all of our plant cells, and these act as a physical barrier. Downside is that if we have things like the aphids that are feeding our plants, they're going to cause damage to those cell walls, which then provides an entry route for pathogens. Second one are the waxy cuticles that form that protective barrier across the surface of the leaves. And the third one is the bark on trees. So the bark itself is made of dead cells, which makes it quite tricky for the pathogen to actually get through dead cells to the living bits underneath. And the bark will also flake off. And as the bark falls off, so do any pathogens that are on it. Our second kind of defence is the chemical defence. And what we actually find here is that there's a couple of different ways that the plants can do this. Firstly, they could actually create antibacterial chemicals that will kill any bacteria that then invade. And a good example of this is witch hazel. And you can see that at the top there. Another option available to them is to produce poisons. And the whole idea of producing these poisons is to try to deter any herbivores or insects from eating them. So things like foxgloves in the bottom left there or deadly nightshade, these produce poisons that will prevent those herbivores eating them and therefore prevent them damaging them. Just as a side note, they're also quite poisonous to humans, so don't eat those plants. The third and final type of defence are the mechanical defences. Now, this could be as simple as having thorns or hairs on the outside in order to stop animals touching or eating them and thereby prevent them damaging them. Or it could be something that's a little bit cooler. In the UK woodlands, we've actually got a lot of these plants called mimosa. So if you wander through a woodland, you'll see them there in the middle there on the right hand side. And what makes these plants so cool is that if you touch their leaves, then they actually fold up. So you can see the two on the left there are these very thin looking leaves because they folded them all in to protect them. So you can imagine if it does it when we touch it, it does it when other organisms or animals that would have eaten them would touch them and it just protects them from damage there. The other thing that plants have actually adapted to do is to actually mimic other organisms to protect them from damage. So passion flower leaf, you can see in the bottom right there, then that one's got those yellow spots on it. It's not some kind of a deficiency. It's actually developed those yellow spots to look like butterfly eggs, because that means a butterfly won't lay its eggs there and therefore the caterpillars won't eat those leaves as they hatch. So plants aren't just these things that sit there and wait for us to care for them. They've got a range of techniques that they can use to then protect themselves from damage and therefore infection. Hopefully at the end of this video, you can recall the different types of plant diseases along with their examples. You can recall how we can detect plant diseases, how we identify them, and then the different defense mechanisms that plants have to protect them from any of these diseases.